Hello everyone and welcome back to my Power Ranking series. For our number 20 team, we're going to be looking at the Indianapolis Colts. Alright, so offensive line and the quarterback. We have a new quarterback here again. Uh, tons of quarterback turnover here for the Colts, which is part of the reason why I do have them lower. These quarterbacks just don't ever have enough time to, to have any sort of staying power, developmental power with the, the team they're at, especially when there's a good amount of turnover. So I'm hoping Matt Ryan can at least be here for a couple years and stop that cycle. And I do actually like the fit. I know not everyone is huge on this, uh, especially after the Carson Wentz thing didn't <clears throat> overly work. But I I actually like Matt Ryan for this offense and for the, what they want to do a lot better. <clears throat> I think he provides much closer to what they were wanting out of uh, Rivers in the short time they had him here. And I think their technical quarterback ceiling with with Ryan here should be a little larger uh, than when they brought Rivers in last time. Ryan's still fairly productive, still able to push the ball downfield, make reads. I don't know if his issues getting the ball into the end zone when it when in the red zone within about 20 yards of the end zone is going to show up here like it did in atlanta we'll see even if it does though thankfully this scheme is designed for uh guys like jonathan taylor or naheem hines to to finish the the job so to speak so it's not gonna be all on ryan to to produce and put that into the end there now at the offensive line it's gotten worse in some spots, I'm not huge on Pryor or Pinter, who are replacing guys I think are much better. Uh, so there there are question marks there. Uh, they lost those guys to free agency. They could uh, dive in with some of the guys who are still out there and bring them in to play some of these roles. Uh, which I think is not a bad idea for them to look at. We'll have to see how training camp and preseason goes for them, but this is... Uh, at least on my paper, I would not tout these guys very highly, and I think they may end up proving to be an issue. Now, who I don't think will be an issue is uh, Smith and Kelly, who are, I mean, not quite star players, uh, in my opinion, like the or deserving of my version of a star, where you have to be basically a superstar. But they're, they're incredible players. They're really high at their position. They're highly touted, and for good reason. I like a lot of what they do. Uh, and I think they can be very productive. I think they can also keep Matt Ryan upright and lead this offense further down. Now, I did forget the the rookie, but uh, Rayman there is a rookie. He doesn't have a little rookie patch, but it, he is, even though he's, uh, I think he's 24 now, if I remember correctly. Uh, so, older tackle. He could eventually be taking over prior spot to play left. I would not be overly surprised. My issue with, with Rayman is... There was already some instances of his technique not being enough. And then to tout that with, he did not test very well with long arms either. He he showed up pretty short. Uh, and his height already makes it kind of hard to push him into guard. So he kind of is a weird anomaly at tackle where it's like his arms aren't technically meeting the threshold that um, was kind of set by tackles, right? When you look at history of how guys have panned out, uh, basically no tackle under a 33-inch arm length uh, is able to be good. That's just kind of how that's, that's worked. It it has, you have been able to get away with it on the interior. There's a couple exceptions on the interior with guys being able to get away from it. Uh, just because they have either insane athletics, good technique, or a combination of both. So... This was kind of why I was lower on Rayman. He kind of has to beat every odd to be good in this league. So I think taking a shot on him isn't the worst idea. But if he doesn't work out, I mean, you kind of heard here probably why. It's not really a fault of him. It's more of a fault on the stature he brings in. Now, the last guy I got to talk about is... My favorite interior line prospect I've ever scouted. No guy has ever passed him uh, in my time in scouting. Quentin Nelson has been the only guy I've had as a, I believe, top five 
uh, top five ranking is an interior offensive lineman. Uh, there's been a couple guys who have somewhat crock, uh, cracked the top ten. I believe Zion Johnson this year did crack the top ten, if I'm thinking correctly. Um, but Quentin Nelson is a special athlete combined with a guy who is very good at technique with a certain mindset that is coveted at guard. He he is the definition of checking every box at guard, and I I would be so ecstatic to to have him be <laughs> my guard. That I I mean, if I was them, I've would already extended him. I would be like, whatever the top dollar is, I'd rather pay it now than pay it two years down the line, you know, whatever it was, because it's just gonna it's just gonna go up with a guy like that. Like he's gonna get a Zach Martin type deal, who also is that type of interior guard prospect. It's it, it's an insane player, and I'm glad they have him here. Backfield receivers has gotten a little better. Uh, Mo Ali Cox has kind of taken the, the front load here. They gave him a reasonable deal. Uh, the bigger prize is Jelani Woods behind him. Uh, 6'7", insane straight line speed. Uh, he's a little clunky. I know his testing numbers don't overly show up, but if you watch him on film, I mean, that's just kind of it due to his natural 6'7 frame. It's going to be a little harder for him to, you know, fully sink make quick cut breaks but the Colts have shown really well to understand what tight ends are and what their specialty skill sets are so I expect that they will get Jelani Woods to be extremely productive extremely early uh, I think they know what they have in him and they they know what to do to get him to be uh, a factor in this offense so I would say expect to see Woods earlier rather than later uh, Pittman Jr. here taking the one role. He's just a very solid player. Uh, good body control. Just decent in sinking in his routes and uh, good foot placement on those as well. Uh, I'm not overly huge on him. I don't know if he'll ever reach star quality for me. We'll have to see. Uh, but I think you could do a hell of a lot worse uh, looking for a number one or number two boundary receiver. I think he can fill that role to exactly what you ask of him. Not to mention he is a very solid blocker on top of it. Uh, who also is a very solid blocker who they brought in for the other side is Alec Pierce, who I actually like to... <laughs> I mean, I've been thinking, I was thinking about this a little while ago, thinking about what the Colts want. They could, I mean, technically, yes, they could go pay Julio Jones and see if they can get a couple weeks out of him before the Chargers go out. They could technically go pay... Odell and get the you know number one experience if he is healthy and ready to go. I don't know if that's what they want, so to speak. I think what they almost want is they want two boundary guys who can kind of do a little bit of everything. They're not bad athletes at all. They're actually pretty good athletes for their size that run block very well. And that is exactly what they have in Pearson Pittman Jr. They basically just have two almost I almost want to equivalent to their peak being Jordy Nelson. Like that's kind of the peak of what both of these guys play style is like that's that's their X, which could be I mean that's a star player, but that's that's the peak a good run blocker who has uh, athletics for a guy that size that are uncommon that can kind of you know have good foot placement they'll do what needs to be done and they block extremely well like I I don't think it's overly hard to see the the potential of what the Colts want to do here uh, especially when you see who they have in the backfield. Now, there's still a Paris Campbell here. You do need someone to kind of take T.Y. T. Hilton's role. And Campbell does have the stature that Hilton kind of has, the speed, the quickness. He'll be used on some kind of bootlegs or some kind of uh, gadget roles. Uh, he'll be using the slot probably primarily. Maybe some deep shots on him. We'll see how they use him. But they, they have a couple options with him, so I think they're happy to still have him around. Uh, the biggest prize, though, obviously, is the running backs. I mean, Naheem Hines and Jonathan Taylor are the absolute one-two punch that you wish to have. Taylor is a hard-nosed runner. He could be an every-down back if you really wanted to, but you don't really have to. You don't have to kill your star running back early and have him done by 26. You can have him done by 32 instead because you have Naheem Hines here to take a lot of the third down receiving looks, uh, mix in some inside zone, uh, maybe some zone out of I form as well to kind of confuse the defense. And it allows Jonathan Taylor to rest up and not take nearly as many shots as some of the earlier running backs of age that have kind of died out early. 
So you get to keep Jonathan Taylor a little longer. <clears throat> now, I really like the combination because they do complement each other so well, but I also like the combination as well because I do think that this is going to be a very run-first offense. I don't think... I don't know, people haven't talked about it as much because I know people do want to talk about who is the number one receiver for the Colts. But in an essence, I do think that they want to almost throw the game back to the early 2000s and just pound the ball down, which with the offense they've built, I don't think is necessarily undoable. If they do make playoffs, it is a combination of that that uh, division being a little weaker alongside of teams just not being set or prepared to handle that kind of ground and pound football. I will say definitely the Jaguars who are in their division are not designed to stop a very ground and pound heavy offense, which is problematic because they have the Colts and they have the Titans in that division. Again, I, I don't know quite how that Jags offense went. At least they got Fodokasi. That does help. Regardless, I, I don't be surprised if they overcome my ranking of them just because of combination of weaker division and teams are struggling to deal with a ground and pound offense. Front seven, tons of fun players here that I just absolutely love. I let's go, let's let's go with the the guys I just like. Let's go with Grover Stewart and Bobby Okereke. Good players. They fit that role to a T. Stewart is a very underrated player. He's just extremely solid. Always gives you high in play. I think initially people were a little hesitant, like that's a bit to pay. Um, but after the last couple of years, looking at what what we've seen kind of come out in the draft as these interior guys and you know some of the older veterans are starting to retire, I think that position is becoming a little more a little more valuable. Than, uh, than years past. So I the Grover Stewart contract to me is completely fine. Uh, Bobby Okariki, I think he's a very solid player. He's a good coverage backer as well, which does help uh, help out Darius Leonard. You can keep Darius Leonard in more more to the side, more taking certain looks, and having Okariki take more of the central coverage role, which I think is where he strives the best. Uh, they did like Deo Odeingbo a lot. I was just okay on him. I think they took him. In, yeah, they took him in the second. I had a fourth on him, uh, so a bit of a reach, but I actually am not going to knock them on that. I think there is a world in which they figure this out with Deo. He does have some tools that are of interest for defensive coordinators, so I'm I'm pumping the brakes on myself to wait and see what they do on Deo before I kind of finalize that, yes, that was was a reach, but I will keep an eye on him. So far, though, they have Yannick Ngakwe, who they basically got for nothing uh, for one year, to come in and add pass rush to this de uh, to this defense here. So that means I'll, I'll imagine Deo will probably be taking more of the rundown looks. But Ngakwe is a, just a good rusher. That's really what he is. He doesn't really provide anything special, uh, other than he is very good on the speed rush. He is always someone who can circle around the pocket and provide pressure, which opens up other guys. So is he a guy who is deserving of 20 plus million a year? No, not really. But is he a guy who can get paid 12 very easily? Oh yeah, absolutely. And I think the Colts got him for a very good deal. Uh, and then to pair him with a guy I really liked in the draft and Quiddy Pay, uh, I think is a very good idea. Also someone that Yanni can maybe teach a couple things to as well on the speed rush aspect is, uh, Pay, Pay is a bit of a bigger guy, but he, he does play like a speed rusher. So maybe taking a couple tips from Yannick is not actually a bad idea. Uh, and I really like combining both of them here. I think this is a very fun group at the start. Uh, now for the two prizes. I talked about Darius Leonard early, so I'll talk about him right now. This is a star linebacker who just has an innate ability to get that ball turned over. He has an excellent punch. Uh, and for those of you who don't know what that means, uh, I'm talking about, I think it's often referred to as the peanut punch from Eric Hurley, from Peanut Tillman, which basically means when, when um, a runner is coming to engagement with a defensive player, they basically form their their hand as a fist, and they can either hammer it, so swinging down to hit with the bottom of their fist, or they can straight up do a punch and try to hit it with the knuckles uh, on the ball, 
and often they punch that ball out. Uh, another player who's really good at it is Marlon Humphrey, who will be getting to the Ravens down the road. Um, but Darius Leonard is extremely good at it. Not to mention he is also a almost ball hawking linebacker. He just has a natural gravitation to the ball and ability to get around where the ball is going to be. Uh, he doesn't have the highest end of coverage in 16. He doesn't the highest end run defender. He's just kind of solid in those areas. But his his mindset and his energy in leading this defense, you kind of always need that one one defender who is a little off the rails. That's kind of what Darius Leonard is uh, on this defense. He he provides something special to them, and it, it is very easy to see why the Colts were like, yeah, no no problem, we'll pay you. It, it was a very easy contract for them to, to do. And another very easy trade and then contract for, the, for them to do was getting DeForest Buckner, who is one of my favorite interior defensive linemen in this entire, entire league. I loved Forrest Buckner. He has extreme length. He's not a very loud guy. You don't really ever see him kind of chirping or hear him off the field. He's more quiet and more self-reserved. Uh, but man, do opposing offenses feel him. He is a game wrecker on the interior. Just an absolute menace to society. So I, I love that trade. They flipped their first for him. That was, to me, such an easy move for them to do. Uh, and he fits this defense so well. Pairing him with Grover Stewart is an excellent idea. I think that there is no issues in doing that at all. So I think excellent, excellent move by the Colts. Uh, and also excellent player. This, this is an elite level IDL who... Not only defends the run well, but has extreme uh, interior pass rushing upside, which most quarterbacks would admit uh, is much harder to deal with uh, than an elite edge because they can't step up into the pocket. Okay, couple things here. Uh, I want to talk about Kenny Moore first because Kenny Moore is currently in a contract holdout, so you do have to kind of keep an eye on how that goes if they're able to keep him happy here before preseason starts. He's a premium slot corner, so I, I don't think it's going to be a cheap contract either. And he is pretty critical in this Colts bend-don't-break defense. So keep an eye on how that works. Currently he is here, but his kind of, if he won't he play, uh, it's it's hurting this team's overall a little bit. Um, they, do, they did bring in Stephon Gilmore, though, which does help. He's coming here from the Panthers, and I actually rewatched his tape again recently just because I wanted to see how much of a drop off there was, if any. And there really wasn't. Honestly, he he was still kind of this really great corner. Like no one really talked about him because he, I don't know, that whole situation with the Patriots flipping him to the Panthers really just did it did nothing for both teams, and it just kind of was a like shrug shoulder kind of thing. I don't know. I don't know why either team did it. Especially since the the Panthers had no need to retain him. I mean, they had Henderson, J.C. Horn. I, it's just I don't know. It was, it was a weird move for for both sides to do. Um, I would I always would say expect to have some drop off to happen with Gilmore. I just say always to expect it, but don't be surprised if it doesn't. This scheme should help protect what drop off could happen for Stephon Gilmore uh, within his two year contract year. But regardless, I, I really like the signing of Gilmore 2 here. I think he provides a level of veteran leadership and stability at corner that they have uh, lacked in the last few years. Uh, they do pair him with Isaiah Rogers, who will be taking the other side. I'm not overly high on him, but I will give the Colts some benefit, benefit of the doubt on this. They've managed to have a good defense with what are sought to be lower-end corners. So if Isaiah Rogers ends up actually being pretty good here, uh, or at least isn't as bad as what people think, either through a number of other means, uh, I think it's actually completely fine. I will hold hold and reserve my judgment on having Rogers as your corner two uh, going into the season because I know how they're able to kind of get around some stuff like that. Safety, they brought Nick Cross as a rookie. We'll see kind of how they deploy him. I, I don't know if, how often they'll be using a three-safety look. I don't remember them really ever doing it very often, at least when I was watching the tape. But 
he's at least good depth regardless in case something happens. Julian Blackman, I was super high on in that draft. I I, uh, I wish I had Twitter at the time because I would have tweeted something at the, the Colts when they took him a lot earlier than what consensus was. But man, I was high on Black. I had Blackman as like an early third round pick on my board. I thought this was like an almost can't miss, like almost immediate starting uh, caliber free safety. Not maybe high end immediately, but at least very productive and solid. And he's been exactly that. Unfortunately, some stuff has kind of derailed that. He's been on and off. But that rookie campaign showed that he is was exactly what I thought uh, his tape showed. And I think he can be that again uh, very easily. Especially when you pair him with Kari Willis on the other side, who's kind of more their thumper. Uh, more of the strong safety look. I like him a lot here too. I think he's extremely productive in what he does. I would expect nothing else other than what he's done for them the last couple of years as well. Just extremely solid safety play again for the Colts this year. No change. Uh, special teams and coaching. Uh, I love Rod uh, Rodrigo Blankenship. I thought that was a very underrated uh, pickup for the Colts when they did grab him. Sanchez is a pretty solid punter, but Blankenship is really the prize here. I think he is someone who has the makeup to eventually be uh, what's considered like the top five, top ten kicker. Pretty easy if he's not already rated a top ten kicker. I haven't looked at the numbers in a long time. Uh, but he's so close to earning that star for for being a kicker. I I think it's only a matter of time. It's an if not when. Or at, uh, it's a when not if type thing. Now, for actual special teams, uh, they're always pretty solid here on the Colts. I think uh, uh, Ventrone does actually a really good job getting his guys going, especially with, um, I should have put him up, but uh, a guy that has like EJ Speed uh, and Franklin, I think he does a really good job with. So I'd expect exactly the, the, the same level of quality play on special teams. Like They're always ranked a top 10 special teams for me. Uh, every time I, I go back and I watch, I think they're always going to produce that well. Uh, defensive coordinator Gus Bradley, totally good. I like him in this role a lot better than head coaching, and I think he can coach this de uh, defense a lot better than what people probably give him credit for. Uh, offensive coordinator Brady, totally good. Uh, I think him combining with Frank Reich uh, to run Reich's offense is totally fine. I actually like a lot of what they do, especially which I think this is going to be a very run-heavy offense going into next year. Mike himself as a coach, he's always ranked very highly from from everyone within the league. He's he's not flashy. He's almost Mike Tomlin esque uh, in a way where it's he gets crapped a lot for being not like this high end, super offensive minded or super defensive minded coach where he's not you know conjuring up some of the most crazy things you've ever seen. But he's super solid. His guys love him. He can run this team to a T with zero issues i i think he is almost underrated at this point as a as a head coach now for the power rankings the the colts have a good amount of question marks coming up in the season as i said a lot of them are on the offensive line and how that offensive scheming really comes into place now uh, especially with matt ryan under center it it's you need to kind of see if is that enough for a strong playoff push or do you need another year I like most of the crew here, and I think they've done well to the develop and retain most of the talent they've drafted. There's just some holes that have kind of recently opened up that either guys need to step up big at for this team to function at a high level going into this season, or we're going to be kind of in an up and down season for them waiting till next year. But that being said, I hope you enjoy the video, and I'll see you all next time. Later.